Yeah, but that depends on the um time to spend time. If you can go really small, maybe one to one, even smaller than that. Okay, yeah. Uh, the, the other next question would uh, be, what is the ideal or uh, acceptable gradient index uh, for SRS with a gamma knife? How fast do you go from, uh, uh, not zero to 100, uh, but from, let's say, 60 to 20? Yeah. Yes, and we first try to keep the percent in order to cover the target, and then by the point of gradient in the volume, which is um, inside the 25 percent size, or half of the description of the volume, divided by the description of the volume, and we are typically a different percent in the western tree. Um, that's the golden number that we look at, but for some targets, it's not exhibited for some of the very small targets where actually like a pink one and your formal telemaker is too large, um, you won't actually create you something to do with bigger numbers. Uh, thank you. There are lots of questions coming in. I'll uh, 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 ask another two. Uh, what looking uh, comes of those calculations based on AI images uh, or on X2 data? Is that the question of the line? I, I, I would assume that, that it would be yeah. a gamma knife question. Yeah. yeah, at the moment we use, um, we can use any data set to create your PI and template because it's uh, using a uh, simple TMR based calculation algorithm which is not everything with water. But our current data in the planning system has a uh, Evolution algorithm as well, which is not implemented in the world. We, we just use it in some occasions we want to check the uh, effect of uh, non homogeneities. But yes, we can use MRI for such a scan for those calculations. Thank you. And the, the last question I'd, I'd like to, to pose on, on behalf of the audience is, uh, is one which, which always comes up by um, increasingly comments out, which is how many targets can be considered to be a case that's arrested at that time? I assume that's what you're going to Yeah, I, I think it was or putting them together, like instead of a uh, whole brain shaping, you can do the one before. Now you can do multiple. And the problem again on the planning system, I know that some planning systems are like that they optimize, um, you can go up to 20, or they, they show you some strange numbers, but you can do, I mean, they say they can do multiple. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, at least a few you can do, but depends on how, how you trust your learner. And Bill, and Bill. Well, with Gamma also, we can do a long time. Uh, because, you know, depending on the goals, you don't want to spend very long treatment time. But we have children treated up to eight uh, targets in one section. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Otto. So there are a couple of other questions, but we will try to answer these within the chat. Uh, but in the interest of time, I think we have to move on. Uh, at the moment, most of the treatments we will see in the morning are typically the uh, here. Uh, but, uh, I think, thanks, thanks again, Atusa, that was great. Uh, and thank you all very much for the, for the questions. Uh, we might move on from the brain we are now going down with. Uh, and uh, the, the next lecture is about uh, stereotypic ablative body radiotherapy, so not intraplanar anymore, uh, but within the, in the body as a saber. Uh, and the, the most common scenario, if you look at patterns of care, uh, then the most common scenario is, is really lung cancer. And, and that's what typically centers start off with treating lung cancer, small lung lesions, need either poor small uh, stage uh, uh, one, uh, early stage uh, uh, primary lesions, or more frequently, uh, uh, organic static uh, 
treatments. However, Saban has now been proven to be uh, far uh, useful, far beyond uh, lung lesions. And the next uh, speaker is Adam Yeo. Uh, he will uh, talk about vertebral metastasis in the liver. And he's chosen these two because in patterns of care studies, uh, of, uh, of patterns of practice studies, in the US at least, after lung cancer, the liver and vertebral necks are the second most commonly treated targets in uh, uh, saber treatments. So we felt it would be probably useful because they are actually a lot more tricky in some aspects uh, to, to give a lecture about that. I'm delighted to have Adam uh, deliver on that lecture. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Thomas, for your kind introduction. Um, I apologize that I have on a single screen walking from home today. So can you hear me okay? Is it okay? Yes, yes yeah. I, I can yeah. hear you well. Oh, okay, thank you. So I'll start the, uh, the, the body part. Um, so probably remember the lightsaber, uh, uh, the hero of the world. So I keep referring to the saber, to the uh, saber technique as a saber. So he's talking about something more than one, uh, especially um, uh, we focused on the vertebra and the liver. So actually a number of uh, our colleagues actually contributed, so it's not my own work, it's the collective work from our group. Here we go. So uh, Atisa kindly covered the, the neuro, the, the brain part of it. Uh, typically we'll be talking about the margin of zero for gamma knife and one to two millimeter for SRS or SRT depending on what intent to use. But now we're moving on to the body here and the lung and liver and spine, all those are uh, we talking about the APTV margin. Typically two to five mil, two millimeter maybe the bony mat including the vertebral spine or five mil or more for the moving lesions. So basically it's moving also the head to be very, very rigorous, very high dose gradient. So therefore it actually adds more value from this perspective. So if I can summarize only one sentence, the take home message is yes, by doing SRS also saber, especially in the body part, a physics can add more value and, uh, in the view of the clinical team. So we do the saber uh, in Peter Mac. Um, so I have the list of it here. So if you can see some lesions that you are treating but not listed here, please put the comments on it. Um, so our experience uh, from our department uh, until uh, actually the last year March, uh, we train uh, about over 300, 350 courses, even though we're in the pandemic uh, during this point in time. So, the so Saber until uh, last March here, we just divided different regions in the function of um, the old, uh, uh, for the last 10 years or so. So, most of it is long, so we just move on to something else. So, we focus on the liver and the vertebra. Not the, uh, the bony mat is, is excluded the vertebral body uh, Saber, which is because the Saber has a, a lot more distinct features compared to other bony mat Saber. So, uh, how many uh, saber, uh, the turbo saber or spine saber we are treating. Um, so it's just a pull up the data from here, uh, actually, till last. Uh, um, so, actually, we, it's actually increasing a lot. Uh, so, in the average case, we're talking about well, two cases per month or 23 per year. But actually, we anticipate it will come up more because, according to one of the clinical trials, for example, SC24, the palliative uh, saber spine actually adds a value. Uh, uh, compared to uh, the conventional uh, palliative RT. Um, so, so one saber, uh, probably you don't need to memorize all those. Um, it, this will be shared to you, but the, whole, the primary uh, purpose of this talk is about sharing our clinical evidence. So, uh, actually, uh, it would be helpful for, for you guys actually who are doing uh, the liver and spine saber. So, typically, we're talking about two fractionation, 20 gray in single or 24 gray in two fractions. The number of randomized clinical trial evidence is flooding in. So, the whole take home message from here is actually curative intent for all of this um, metastatic disease or the palliative uh, purpose actually with the saber is being used and that there is some evidence coming in. So the vertebral saber when you look at it, I would pick this case as the most complex, therefore most challenging scenario. It needs most value from physics in terms of plan check and optimization and then uh, physics measurements as well. So the spines here and the air always are uh, very sensitive to zero area structures 
uh, all left with our PTV. Uh, that one is town called also surrounded by a whole bunch of different animals. So the, the, the table saber actually highly complex uh, shape also it demands the most uh, 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 challenge in those gradient uh, by its nature. Uh, so the, uh, the, the distance part compared to fractional or conventional narrative, actually we are higher prioritizing uh, all the others even over that uh, target coverage. So we start from the city simulation. Um, uh, with something to consider immobilization is the key, I would say. And then some of the 3D CT or even 4D CT for the saber. Why for spine saber 3D CT? Um, it's because not only the lesion is moving, but all the surrounding areas. We really want to put the dose or shape out the dose appropriately. It's moving around. So uh, we typically the saber when it is fine, we do 4D CT uh, with the proper, uh, appropriate immobilizations. So um, this, when this 4D CT, this is actually a kidney case, but it's relevant for the liver as well as spine. Uh, can anyone actually pick up something that's going wrong, wrong, wrong here? The good answer is there's a lesion, there's the hint, but the superior and, and inferior part of the lesion uh, actually moving more, but while uh, the, 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 uh, the lesion itself looks static. So when you look at uh, overlay the reading trace here, the 4D CT oh, is actually a regular right at the lesion that the patient scanned uh, so in the direction. So it's very unfortunate at that time um, that the reading was a very regular deal for motion is not uh, tumor excursion is not captured properly. So the take home message when you do 4D CT and QA of it, you have to check the breathing profile at that lesion. So you better to know where the lesion is before you actually look at the uh, uh, 4D and the, doing the QA of it. So uh, comparing the image guidance, uh, the the spinal cord is the main uh, OAR, so uh, we don't really directly constrain to it, but we know there is a geometric uh, uncertainty from uh, uh, the motion uh, aspects, also uh, contouring uncertainty and the planning, the beam model, and the azure, etc. So, the cord PRV we do to constrain to, uh, either it's a one millimeter, some centers using it, or two millimeter. It really depends on what sort of the imaging value you're using to define cord, also it's IGRT capability. Uh, if you have a very accurate IGRT and uh, with uh, very competent MR guided uh, contouring of the code, uh, or the sort of the, the tightest the PRV you can use, but also the same scenario, uh, the two millimeter is a standard in our department. Uh, uh, also, if in case that the MR is not available for any palliative case, it's urgent treatment, and the bone canal is used. Typically, that is actually more uh, 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 forgiving than code, uh, PRV. And other areas, it really depends on which part of the spine you're using, uh, the CT or L spine, and uh, the even close of esophagus and all the uh, GI structures, including our uh, bracket plexus in some case. For the six of uh, the body cut and x ray RGRT is essential uh, in order to deliver that. And uh, we use an exact track and we actually park in our campus, which is a very thorough action level with a 0.5 million which is the same as a uh, SRS scenario. The planning and optimization are, uh, of course, different uh, ob objectives we are using for the one versus two fractions. So the reason why I populate here, as I mentioned earlier, OER constraint is a high prioritized a complete target coverage. When you look at it, the whole PRV, depending on the whole PRV, the 12 way uh, snapping up. So either you can argue that it's a point max dose or the voxel dose, a point of 3 cc, depending on what kind of capability you have in place in your Yes, but typically 12 gray for single fraction, 14 gray, and two, two fraction. We really strict on the highest priority you put. Therefore, that's the most important priority, and then the target coverage priority can uh, uh, follow. So the plan and optimization, as you can see, is really highly uh, challenging. Also, it's demand in treatment planning and delivery point of view. Uh, despite uh, we talked about Eclipse experience only and uh, the two or three arcs, up to three arcs, but most of the two arcs are sufficient as a full arc. And the cold matter will make a mixture of the plan at five degree and one arc, and also we have a second arc actually effectively uh, um, uh, uh, to to uh, to spare at the shape part the spine cold, and then we one arc can be the nine degree. That's kind of uh, the recipe we've been using. And the dose group setting, uh, we have 
go down to the some sort of the smallest, the most finest uh, setting if, if you wish, and the others, and that includes any moving uh, OARs or any uncertainty in the surrounding organs. You better to put some PRB, for example, three millimeter in as an example, and uh, that we constrain to not the direct or uh, the impact OARs. Also, if you have uh, a bowel structure, it's better to make the bowel back rather than structure they can move in different places uh, between simulation and treatment and so it, uh, the message here uh, says uh, from the next uh, hard cast of the beautiful world that uh, we've done the plan change for the sake of vertebral spine there are a bunch of different cases here the take the message is very complex plan a very robust very simple plan but can have a same kind of quality in terms of the scoring defined by the plan change case so yeah, not necessarily the most complex plan with the best quality. So how can you ensure that? So what we try to avoid here is unnecessarily uh, modulated, too highly modulated plans. So in PMAC, what we use is modulation factor definition and a fractional gray. Uh, so if you are describing uh, the 24 and 2, uh, as a 12 gray perfection, uh, we really uh, don't, uh, don't, don't allow uh, the modulation going uh, like 8. 1,500 or so. But typically, around the five or six modulation factor can make this implant and average lift as a sort of surrogate of the how narrow the, of the average lift is. Typically, 10 to 15 millimeter, you can achieve this implant. How do we cure it? Uh, actually, uh, we have a script to run, and uh, even before that, rather than we check the what is approved, sometimes we actually give a feedback during the communication between. And our QA process uh, is a mixture of the 3D virtual dose and independent dose check, also uh, as well as the measurements. Uh, so we use Mobius, and but the, the trick is uh, uh, the tricky part is our accuracy algorithm, which is dose to medium, which actually uh, deposit those uh, has a little sort of different in bone material, whereas our Mobius is dose to raw, even though it has collapsed con convolution algorithm. So you can actually see some discrepancy there, but that, that not necessarily actually be true. So we do use a 3% more new uh, type tolerance to check that. And so delivery, uh, we also check against the MTD to make sure the delivery is the same as what is planned. And so when you actually calculate with those two uh, water algorithms, so the, the reporting system is same, actually much better uh, matched. So that's not only one, so spine case is only one we uh, measure with for every single vena plant. Uh, so we use this so-called world or a mini world sort of updated version uh, where this uh, acrylic or PM made uh, uh, material and uh, the size and mini world is sort of updated one uh, now it's a water uh, material and much easier to handle. So this one example is a T-spine with a, with a spine called a left around and therefore demand very high dose rating and the setup and then we actually have to apply trembling before we beam on the phone. So this typical example at the best case scenario I would say it was happy, this is path for a QA, right? But that's not only what that always happen. So a lot of cases uh, the film batch has an issue and uh, sometimes you might need to uh, attempt, uh, attempt it to rescale but you cannot rescale if there's a, the other absolute dosimetry information. But the way we design our uh, the, the phantom we have a point of insert here so actually that's the micro diamond in this scenario you can measure the, the, uh, those accurately in the high dose gradient uh, uh, area. So it, you know, if there's a known dose you can renormalize to it if the film is off. So it's a, it's a choice of uh, uh, the, your department and the, and, the, and the collective decision what kind of uh, QA tool you can use. So in our case, we, we check overall 3D dose distribution using an independent 3D dose calculation algorithm for movies, also we measure uh, 2 d plane, including some code grading uh, the interface. So I'll move on uh, in 30 minutes. I'll move on to the liver side. I'll get the question collectively at the end of the talk. So the liver is, is very, it's still challenging, but with a different reasons, right? So we'll cover some, uh, well, why we do the liver saver and what adds the value from the radiotherapy perspective. Also, we'll go through some uh, workflow from similar uh, and uh, uh, prior to simulation and uh, scanning and planning and agility, etc. Okay, so anatomy to consider the liver. Okay, it's uh, as complex as a spine case. 
because the liver become the receive the lesion with this and we know it's noticeable it's moving and deforming not only the liver uh, uh, open itself but all the surrounding GI uh, structures it changes it gets deformed it due to it emptying and thinning and also the uh, respiratory motions and then all of those have a different extent of the radio sensitivity uh, which really need to take into account uh, so you better to know what we're doing so why uh, uh, liver saver um, so again, liver saver actually works uh, for both, uh, for both uh, the primary HCC also the liver mat. So I always quote uh, this paper here. Uh, the take message uh, the, is uh, what I, uh, uh, the most important number from the duration of the liver saver is BD 100 gray. Okay, the BD 100 gray is the clear difference in between uh, if the HCC in this scenario. If you can bump up those, uh, so the BD can be over 100, uh, we actually as a we see the notice of the change in total tumor control. Okay, so the BD 100 gray is the key term. Uh, if you see actually there's an abundant uh, extent of the clinical evidence from the clinical trials. And not only the uh, the HCC of so the liver, uh, actually the same BD 100 applies, but actually even greater is this in between uh, above and below BD. So, um, so it's so, so actually the, the higher, the uh, more bump up, bumping up the dose actually uh, have a better control rate. So what that means, if there's no motion, if there's a very small lesion, a small size, and that we can minimize the dose around the liver or other way around, and that we, it's, it's desired to bump up those and make a higher prescription if we can. But the, the surrounding liver has its own constraints. Uh, so it, it, the liver toxicity is really uh, well uh, documented. Uh, it is, is in function of the main liver dose here. So we have the two conflicting um, the factors here. We want to pump up those as high as we can, uh, we want uh, to GTV and high GTV, including the motion part. But also right surrounding uh, the li healthy liver, the actual main liver dose is a strong uh, correlation there in terms of the, uh, toxicity, right? So they, so therefore uh, another key term here. It's an isotoxic approach. We want to bump up prescription uh, as high as we can, as long as the liver is safe. The HCC, so that is the very degree of the prescription, the 25 and 5 fraction, if there's any surrounding areas or large lesion itself is very large, uh, that's 25 and 5. It can be beneficial when there's no other surgical option or other lactase or uh, radio options. So, and then the liver mineral here. Uh, that's published data uh, uh, in function of the liver dose um, with the, uh, how much liver or volume is getting for uh, the liver So the technique is here, actually, uh, if, 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 if the mean dose, uh, it's, if you can make it lower than 15 grams for certain volume, uh, which is 860 of the healthy liver, which is defined by liver mass. Actually, we have a quite good confidence that our liver or the product of the uh, not have a com uh, complication where we actually uh, prescribe ablated dose. So in PMA what we do, uh, safety test is a bit more thorough uh, 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 than uh, what is published here. So we use a 700 cc for the liver minus GTV that is defined as a, as a healthy liver case to receive 15 grade of the uh, That's the primary objective here. <coughs> so what we know about the liver, so the liver control, uh, we have to Related to be the hundred gray, so it's a we we, and then uh, it's this will tolerate this ablated dose if the liver and surrounding GI structures are uh, uh, respected well during the pain and delivery processes. Uh, so both for the liver saver we use isotoxic uh, approaches, and uh, if the liver moves a lot, that isotoxic approach uh, is. It's, it, it is heavily dependent on what kind of management uh, process you are going to. Therefore, physics can add more value in terms of uh, simulation and motion management and management, etc. Okay, so GI structures uh, change position, so the straight fast control core is adjacent, they are quite adjacent to uh, the target or uh, the health deliver, and then we have to uh, very thoroughly uh, monitor during the RGRT and the planning process. So how do we do with the simulation imaging and motion management measure for liver and surrounding OIRs? That's our cover for the rest of the talks.
Okay, uh, more than 10 minutes. I'm going right here. So I'll spend more time on them, how we uh, deal with the liver. So before going through the technical details, is an MBT approach. Really, it, it's not only the solid play from the team. Uh, it's really challenging, but actually can be done appropriately if you have a good team. It, 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 it includes the uh, clinician, our own therapy, physics, and the nursing for the contrast, and diagnostic imaging, and then our radiologist, and, and the nuclear medic medicine, our clinicians, and technologists. So uh, it's a quite busy slides, but um, this is sort of the marker. It's called clinical marker we perform as MDT as a physicist and a therapist in the machine prior to simulation. Basically, before simulation, we have a separate um, appointment session uh, in order to determine uh, a patient capability of the motion and restriction, I would say, the management, uh, what kind of approach we use for simulation as well as the, uh, the second engine video version of the next uh, okay. So there's the markup is the uh, upstream issue to test the patient capability that affects all the downstream of the uh, RT chain. Um, so uh, this is a bit outdated, so we want to so the static lesion, level static motion, uh, lesion study, so we can bump up those as high as we can, while we can limiting our liver main bones. Uh, so that is uh, the, the most uh, uh, highest priority. If patient, patient cannot do a breath hold, I probably can uh, reduce the motion during free breathing with abdominal compression belt. Uh, if the abdominal compression belt doesn't really work at all, so let's say for example, a uh, four millimeter or better uh, reduction in terms of liver bone motion, which cannot achieve that, um, we, we might uh, consider the free breathing, uh, the gating around the external beam, right? Um, so all those, uh, I'll show, just uh, show a few examples how we uh, determine that uh, as a uh, as a markup scenario on the machine. We use our uh, linear accelerator. Uh, fortunately, we have a luxurious uh, stereotactic dedicated machine, so they are really capable of booking some machine time uh, for patient uh, to, uh, to to go through the markup. So this is quite one example. It's a uh, liver don't keep clearly visible next ray in the floor. So we measure that uh, uh, during the exhale breath hold. Also, if they can hit the same spot in each breath hold, also it can hold it long enough because that's a good uh, surrogate uh, it, it reproducibility or stability or, uh, throughout the treatment. If, if patient can hit the same spot but cannot hold long enough, uh, that's also not a, a, not a good news. Right. So, and then we also measure uh, level one motion during the free breathing as well as a baseline. So our uh, breath hold, uh, so can we do DIBH or like our breast case or why exhale breath hold? Right, um, the typical DIBH, the patient can have a different amount of the inhale uh, intake of the air. So the reproducibility wise, exhale breath hold, the airing out, uh, actually can be a lot more uh, stable or reproducible to hit the same spot uh, when patient thinks exhale with breath, breath out. So that's the rationale about it. Uh, unless there are special in cases uh, to DIBH uh, can add a value, for example, uh, getting the lesions away from uh, central uh, structures or heart or areas. Uh, apart from those special cases, uh, the vast majority of uh, liver, the EBH, is what we try to achieve if patient can uh, perform external breath hold. Uh, those uh, uh, are one of spotted by the crystal box uh, the work there. Uh, the reason why we do EBH. Uh, against the idea. So this is what we do during the floor. And um, okay, so the patient. Uh, this is a uh, floor during the break for the uh, DIBH here. So actually, there's a very uh, a minimal residual motion during the gate uh, breath hold with second gating window, which we use with the RPM device invariant solution with a 0.2 uh, upper and minus 0.1 uh, uh, as a lower. Uh, in terms of RPM motion and post correction. So the, the very new residual motion within the gating window for the extra breath hold. And some patient, you know, we think that our surrogate of RPM device, any other surrogate, is within, within gating uh, a threshold, but internally the anatomy wise actually is moving well. So in that case, RPM is not a good surrogate in, uh, as, a, as a measure of their level of reproducibility. So not all patients work. Perfectly. Uh, typically, the obese or large patient, uh, this on the surface, thinks it's the same position, 
but the internally it actually is, is, is more, uh, gives more chance. So the free breathing, uh, this is one of the extreme case, actually up to four centimeter we occasionally see with how much we move. Imagine we try to treat this as saber without motion management, uh, probably we cannot achieve that particular point uh, in the saber, the saber in the prescription. And the other compression, of patient cannot do extra breath hold, we apply up the uh, compression in order to reduce the motion uh, during free breathing. So it's no interruption on the beam, we treat throughout uh, free breathing, but we do reduce the motion. Uh, even this is not preferred approach anymore from our clinical team because we know the full breathing gating are effectively the same as, uh, as similar as XL breath hold but lower to decide for it. it takes longer to treat but whenever it goes to the uh, full breathing whenever it hits the full breathing uh, at XL spot you can be in there that's the, the next uh, uh, third option if patient cannot do uh, perform XL breath hold that some patients cannot really go to the, uh, the stable baseline in terms of exhale position, uh, so in that case, patient cannot really do full body gating option. In that case, the only option is a abdominal compression case. The abdominal compression doesn't add much value, so not much difference between full breathing and, uh, with and, or, and without uh, compression. And the only full breathing treatment is the remaining option. In that case, we have to reduce uh, the prescription dose to respect the mean liver dose. So imagery in that case markups decided. Um, so what can be done for the treatment, simulation and treatment? And so in that this imagery registration is really key uh, it, it, before we move on to planning, right? And there are some some people that you question uh, we can use a lot lots of bunch of a secondary images that I will show and the different image registration can add a value. Uh, but the, in, in our clinic we are not really using that yet. Uh, only we're using when I mean, there is a, a retreatment of the recurrence and, and if we should do the second or third liver saver we might uh, want to have a more accurate deformable, uh, deformable dose accumulation on, on, in terms of some dose. So ideal case, uh, we want plain CT in the static position and also uh, we want the secondary images uh, to visualize tumor for the target delineation on the same position. Have a control CT MR and had a bunch of different sim, uh, secondary images option uh, to, to, to see where the lesion is because plain CT cannot see where the lesion is typically. So um, so typically what we will do is we do contrast CT on the same position and at the same acquisition session with the planning CT to have the best match on the same day on the same position. So I'll show you one of the example. The reason why the contrast CT it is possible because the liver has a very uh, unique visual adopt uh, the system here uh, so the contrast city and the washing and washer process there's a certain contrast difference in terms of uptake uh, and then getting that out uh, for, for the liver uh, compared to uh, the tumors cells here so is that, that, that this is the outer is it easy very easy to monitor uh, from the certain level uh, we are going through and then there's sort of contrast the different for the liver and HCC. So the, the, the white line here is a sub, uh, subtraction line between liver and HCC. So what that means, uh, since it goes in the outer and the, the liver dome level in terms of superior inferior direction, and there's a certain window, it's very valuable for us, we can take the quick scan. Uh, which is wash in period here about the 35 seconds and then another 25 uh, 20 to 25 seconds later it wash out so the washing we call it arterial phase uh, where we can we, we really show tumor cell can take more uptake uh, compared to surrounding tissues it lights up and then uh, on the, when the ash wash out actually it, it have a um, the hypodense uh, in, in, in the cell compared to surrounding tissue I'm talking about HCC is the primary bacteria uh, scenario, but also it's useful for our net scenario as well. I'll show in the following slides. So this typical example of the HCC, the so arterial phase. Typically, it actually lights up where we can really see the where tumor is without this contrast. It's very hard to accurately delineate the lesion. And so it gets a hyperdense uh, in the portal venous. So the both phases, wash in, wash up, are variable. Uh, in HCC, but the MET is easier. Uh, typically, portal venous is good enough. So I have a contrast in, in the washout phase to see where the lesion is uh, compared to surrounding healthy tissue. Um, so in this case, this is ideal. We want to acquire, for example, XL breath hold. We want the 
uh, secondary images in this Excel breadboard is where we want to see the region and control and accurately uh, delineate the target without the blurring uh, motion. And how, how can we uh, accurately register that and transfer the target uh, contour uh, structure to planning CT? Um, so we want exactly the same breadboard level in simulation, this ideal scenario. If you do the free breathing 4D CT, we match uh, this uh, the breadboard level of the contrast image to one of the uh, uh, phase of the 4D CT to transfer. So the uh, people are tem attempted to use uh, PET uh, because PET is long acquisition, it's a free breathing manual patient or a lot of us cannot hold the breath for that long. So a, it, it, by its nature the 3D CT has a blurring uh, effect in, in place and the 4D PET CT can be used for planning if that CT component from 4D PET CT scanner can be directly used for planning. And on the right side is a contrast CT as an example. So the PET is typically used as a, a detection or diagnosis and the guidance purpose only. And some of them really want to use MR, and the, but MR typically at, uh, acquired a, a breath hole, but the inhale. So it typically we, we, we use exhale breath hole for the treatment. The guidance purpose only as well. So the, as, a, as a summary, so IV contrast, uh, which we always aim to acquire uh, without motion blurring, which is breath hold, any level, ex, uh, ideally exhale, patient cannot do any level of breathing phase. We want steady uh, liver motion acquisition with IV contrast, which can be used for accurate target delineation. Uh, so the contrary and the fusion uh, and motion management process is MDT approach. Okay, So we really add the value on there, but all the other secondary images it, it, it's uh, the guidance and the diagnosis purpose only in our departments. So quickly go to one of some, some example scenarios. So there's no tree in this case. So typically uh, com uh, uh, compared to SRS case, it's, it's, we, we, we desire intentionally non isotropic follow. So we shape out those distribution to certain direction. Uh, so we can spare our surrounding or OARs or help the liver in, 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 intentionally to the certain direction. The two uh, typically in this case, the full arc is not really recommended at all because we want two third arc in the one direction, and uh, also the collimator angle, minus zero angle recommended, so not to accumulate all those uh, interleaf uh, leakage throughout the, the venal delivery. And the modulation is really beneficial to shape out the uh, the dose uh, against the away from the surrounding uh, critical structures. And the uh, prescription dose max dose typically goes over 125 percent of the prescription though. So we, we intentionally, intentionally put the hotspot as another distinct feature uh, from the SABA uh, planning compared to uh, conventional RT, right? But, but despite we allow the very hotspot, but it has to uh, be defined, located at the center of the GTV. So imaging slides have been very fine uh, if you can make it. So that those grids it should be similar as a spine case. We we we, 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 we desire we demand that uh, very fine uh, those grid resolution for uh, during the optimization as well as uh, the final dose calculation as well. So imagine we have a plan. Uh, how can we accurately uh, locate or uh, visualize uh, the tumor and then liver uh, accurately on set before we put the, put the beam. Up? So a bunch of um, um, the surrogate we can use that fiducial market, which is we implant, implanted specifically for a liver saver. There's uh, uh, some clinical trials going on in the globe, including Australian one. Um, so also, there's some residual from the surgical process that's required that can be used, but that can actually phase out or migrate. And the stent is we strongly recommend not to use a stand because it's well, uh, notoriously uh, uh, known that that can uh, change the direction of well, uh, uh, independent from uh, the surrounding uh, actual anatomy. So the stand is not surrogate uh, uh, to monitor as a surrogate of that uh, targets during the IGRT process. Um, so the clinical example here, um, so as I mentioned, the uh, liver windows, uh, so we have a script here, okay, so we, the water, we check, uh, we check that, okay, uh, healthy liver that is well respected. Okay. And if there's only surrounding OAR, so they don't, what a second check is uh, the optimization structure, they don't optimize directly to impact OAR, they put certain uh, margin PRV around it. Okay, so it's, it becomes robust to expect it an anatomy change between simulation and uh, your IGRT beam on the day of treatment. 
Um, so in this case, it's capable of EDH, it's IDO, also IDO because peripheral lesion. In this case, uh, our, our basic mark experience, some patient cannot do the breath work well due to the shoulder pain, and uh, the left arm is okay to be down. With the one arm up, which is the right side where the lesion is, so we don't want to both to be on uh, the arm for, in terms of the beam pathway. So we ask the patient to arm up on the right side, but left arm can be down, which actually makes a big change that might allow a patient to do uh, X-ray back work. Um, so this is the phantom case, but the typical scenario how we do uh, uh, the gated combin. My video is not working. So imagine this is a phantom case, but the way that it, uh, um, so I mentioned upper is a point two, uh, point two, and lower the minus point one. Uh, within the gating window, it actually beams on for the corn beam. So it's a gated corn beam we are taking. It really gives a really good workflow where we image where we aim to treat. Right? Uh, so I'll move on. So the gated corn beam really valuable. Imagine this is a case. We can't really see the lesion at all in corn beam before we hit the beam on. So I can move on. So, so in this case, I would say the liver is a really good surrogate to match to it. And so I'll call it PDF, it's not the PDF document, uh, the probability density function, it's a basically light profile, and then you basically match uh, around where the lesion is. So uh, the, it's not the, the, the y axis, the HU, it, it, it's not really important because the HU might be different between your know, beam and uh, plain CT. Uh, but actually, the, the, the gradient here from the air to the soft tissue of the liver down, how it is the width. Uh, that's actually more important to, to ensure that it's good matching between uh of the day and the plain CT. Also, if there's any residual, uh, the good cell gate uh, or inside the GTV or nearby, even though it's outside, we can actually take that attributed imaging uh, during beam on of the MV beam. Um, so we can ensure that that uh, is, is within the, the predefined contour plus. Uh, the the fiducial plus a certain margin typically we put three millimeter as a PRV to fiducials. So it can be really useful to ensure that uh, we are hitting this target. So those are the examples. Um, so what values we can add uh, as a physicist uh, to the MDT team for Sabre and uh, Liver uh, Sabre programs. So basically, as a physicist, we can add a value uh, throughout, uh, uh, throughout the chain from the start, even before simulation. Uh, to the IGRT and the treatment. So happy to take some any questions. Thank you very much, Adam. This was a whole school in one uh, in forty minutes. Uh, very impressive, <laughs> and in a very broad coverage uh, of, of lots and lots and lots of things uh, uh, overall. So th thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, in, in the chat. Uh, I, I, by mistake, I've already answered some of them, uh, but and I hope that this is actually useful for, for everybody in the audience. I might just to pick up uh, the, the last one, which hasn't been answered. Uh, what do you prefer for version uh, management? Uh, uh, SGR2, surface guidance, or RPM-based motion management? Um, if, if, if you have all the uh, SGRT system in place, potentially that can um, replace RPM, which is a certain point or part of the body. But uh, as far as I know, some uh, SGRT solution is not really there yet in order to execute uh, uh, the breath hold uh, gaping gating scenario. Uh, also, whenever there's a baseline change, you have to capture it to get a reference surface again anyway. So that really doesn't give a, a, a the smooth process as smooth as the existing RPM scenario uh, as of today. But in future, I look forward to uh, further improvement. We can really smooth things out. So we can use the whole body, any area of interest in the body surface to use in order to enable the gating. And there's a, a certainly exciting changes, exciting technologies coming in, but not everyone has access to the, these things. And there was a, a really insightful question about uh, any recommendations for developing countries where 3 CT and 6 degrees of freedom touch are not available. Do you have any details of wisdom? 
Uh, well, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's fair comment. If there's uh, no, no technologies available, you know, they can really uh, pursue uh, safer programs there, especially for liver and saber. Uh, I, I would say uh, there's a clinical need and the, the demand for the patient. Uh, we can pursue, but really a cautious approach with appropriate margins. And the clinician needs to be aware of the increasing uncertainty uh, throughout planning and sort of delivery processes. So at the end, the practical way is actually additional margin need to uh, put on. That needs to be acknowledged by clinical uh, clinicians. So I think you know, there, are, there are certain part of the world it, they are actually doing with us itself, uh, with a rigorous, or somewhat more time consuming but longer process to, in order to achieve the accuracy and the delivery. Yeah, I, I think these are really valuable uh, comments in the six degrees of freedom college. Then it, it just is inevitable that the patient needs to be set up more frequently uh, or different immobilization may, may need to be used. Uh, in, in any case, now, I think that, that was such an important message of, of Adam, where a physicist must be part of this decision-making program. And uh, it, it's really that the physicists uh, input into uh, this, this uncertainty analysis and the risk analysis uh, with the tool help to, to allow to these treatments to be done by really a vast range of different technologies. I, in the interest of time, uh, unfortunately we have to move on. Uh, please ask further questions. Uh, we try to, uh, to answer them in, in the chat. Uh, and the last speaker goes from the small to the big. Uh, we, are, we are now moving to its special procedures with a particular emphasis uh, on, on procedures which treat the whole body or uh, the uh, whole skin of the whole body. And I'm delighted to introduce Peter Lansky, who's a senior medical physicist here at Peter Mac, uh, and uh, is uh, working with the uh, uh, TBI and TBE team there. Over to you, Peter. Thanks very much, Thomas. Hopefully, you can see the slides and hear me clearly. And if so, you will. Get started. So I'm covering two topics today. I'll probably dedicate about 15 minutes um, to each of them. In practice, I think you could spend hours on each of them, but um, we'll try to keep to the, the physics aspects that are perhaps more exciting for us. So as Thomas alluded, we're looking at now a different kind of special in terms of special techniques. We've talked about SRS and Sabre fields, so they're very small, but now we're looking at TBI and TBE fields. So this is quite a very different um, type of special techniques. So for this presentation, we're going to discuss some of the physics aspects of total body irradiation, or TBI, which involves large photon fields. And also then the second half of the, the session, we're going to talk about TBE, total body electron treatments. Um, we're going to look at some treatment planning aspects of each, look at the treatment delivery and some of the technical considerations, but then also highlight some of the um, dissertary challenges, so those physics aspects that keep us physicists um, quite um, uh, involved in these techniques. Um, so for the first half, we're going to look at total body um, radiation. So TBI is used in conjunction with chemotherapy in preparation um, for a bone, bone marrow transplant. So these are things like leukemias where the patient's um, got some sort of blood disease. We at VCCC, at PETAMAC, treat approximately 30 patients per year, which comparing our workload to other centres, both locally, nationally, as well as internationally, makes us a relatively busy centre. And it's interesting to note that this workload did not particularly drop off during the pandemic. So this is still quite an important and relevant treatment option for a lot of patients. But being 30 patients a year, it's also quite a specialised technique. Despite being a very, very relatively busy centre, um, it's still quite specialised. Uh, so the aim of TBI is to give a uniform dose um, for the whole body. We're specifically targeting the bone marrow and circulating the volume. There's a variety of different prescription use, and prescriptions used for this technique. Um, 2 gray single fraction, 13.2 gray in 11 fractions, 12 gray in 6, and these are just some of the common ones. There are also a few different options um, as well. 
just as there are different prescriptions, we also have various delivery techniques. So we've got just a quick example of some of the different options for delivering TBI. But this is by no means a comprehensive list. There's pretty much as many techniques as there are centres delivering TBI. For the most part, uh, some of the common features involve large photon fields, lower dose rates, and in most cases extended SSD in order to make use of that, that photon beam, usually from a linear accelerator, but other um, units are also um, helpful. And if you do a quick literature search, you can see that there are a lot of challenges involved in trying to um, consolidate um, data for TBI patients because every centre seems to be doing something slightly different. So not only do we have a variety of descriptions, but we also have um, different techniques. And of course, a lot of the papers will highlight the resource um, demands for a TBI service. Um, so just putting um, graphically some of these different um, technology options. So we can have standing TBI with a standard LUNAC um, at extended source to surface distance. We can have a sweeping technique where the patient is static but the beam is swept across the patient. We can have a line technique and this is particularly important if patients come to us who are too unwell to stand for a long time, sometimes a lying option really is essential. Um, and there's different options available as well, many more than I can put on this slide. Um, so clearly set up in the technology can vary depending on your centre. So this is by no means a straightforward special procedure to deliver. Uh, recently, Lottie Fogg and colleagues um, published on the results of a survey that was conducted throughout Australia and New Zealand, and this was um, sent out to all radiofocus centres who were developing a TBI program and asking them some relatively basic questions about their TBI procedures. This involved what dose are you using, what linear rep rate or, or uh, monitoring that's per minute are you using, what source to surface distance are you using, and almost every centre answered something slightly differently. So this, and this is just within Australia and New Zealand, so this really highlights how complex this can be um, between centres, you might get very really different treatment techniques. There are some common features, 12 brain six fractions seem to be a, a relatively common prescription, and although there's no agreement on the exact amount of dose rate, you can see that a reduced dose rate is a common theme, even if we go into a treatment with the same um, dose rate. Um, does the radiation oncologist even know? So it's really not at all centres, although mostly yes. Um, and of course, a variety of centres in paediatrics or in adults. So I'm going to focus more specifically on the techniques that we use at Primac, just because that's what I'm more familiar with. But don't take this as a um, way of treating TBI. This is just what we have experience with. So we use two techniques at Primac. We have a standing technique, and you can see here where the patient is actually standing in a, a frame. And this serves a few purposes. First of all, we can put a perspex beam square between the patient and the linear accelerator. And second of all, we have um, bars that sit under the patient's armpits to help stabilize them and gives them something to hold on to during their treatment. You can see the linac is um, uh, facing the patient on its, on its side. And for us, we use a four meters source to surface distance um, to the For the line technique, we can also see a very similar theme with the linac tilted on its side and facing the wall. But in this case, we've got patients um, lying in a TBI-specific custom trolley. This also allows us to have a beam spoiler um, degraded the beam between the patient and the other accelerator. And for lying techniques, we either use a two-field technique where the patient lies on the side for an APPA arrangement, or lies on the side as well as on their back to come for a four-field technique, which is APPA as well as two laterals left and right. So these are two um, very sort of standard for us um, treatment delivery options. Here's another slide sort of trying to demonstrate the differences between these two techniques. Showing also dose counts from actual patients that we have planned and treated. So if patients for us undergo a CT scan lying down in a supine position, um, from the top of the head to about mid thigh. So it's not a full body CT scan as much as we can use fit in and then they are planned for us in the equipped treatment planning system. 
Um, so you can see for the standing technique, um, the patient gets relatively uniform throughout the whole body, with the exception of these two regions, the cold regions, where the lungs have actually been shielded. So what we can attach to this perspex frame of the standing TBI trolley is actual lung blocks, which helps us to reduce the lung doses to these standing TBI patients. On the other hand, you can see for the lying technique, um, the patient is actually scanned with a head compensator for the lateral beams, and that's to reduce hot spots in the head uh, for the patient as well as the neck. You can see also the chest bolus, which is used to reduce the lung dose from the lateral beams. And various additional perspex spoilers to kind of even out that dose distribution to any thin regions. So the legs, ankles, anywhere that's quite thin that would get a high dose is given additional perspex compensation to even out the dose distribution. There's also some perspex beam spoiler added in the CT scan, which is included in um, treatment plan. So this is again highlighting the line to the eye technique in um, sort of a diagram format with one of our RTs very generously um, volunteering to demonstrate the two line positions. Okay, so you can see again the lateral fields, so we use our head compensators, chest bolus, and um, additional compensators for the legs. And for the ant post fields, the patient lies on our side, has a cushion or a pillow for support and neck bolus as well as the leg perspex um, blocks are used as compensators to reduce hot spots to those thin areas. But you feel here we're satisfied where we really don't want any hot spots um, as such. So for the TBI, we'll stick for us is typically 12 gray and 6 fractions, although we also can do a 2 gray single fraction with an ad post present with arrangement. But 12 gray and 6 fractions twice a day is our standard technique. So that uses four fields, APPA as well as left and right, and these are delivered in two sessions. The ant post fields would be delivered in the morning, the patient goes away for a rest, and between six and, hours six and eight hours later, they'll come back for their left and right lateral fields in the evening, giving a nice break in between um, sessions. Uh, so as I mentioned, the head compensator and chest bones are used for the lateral beams only. Um, so the head compensator is to reduce the hot spots in the head and neck area, and the chest bolus actually helps to reduce the lung doses. And perspex spring is used as a beam spoiler for all fields. So at simulation, um, we have some specific guidelines for patient setup for their CT scan. So for a lying TBI, the patient actually has their arms resting on foam blocks. And we are intentionally here for the lateral beams, adding the arms in the beam path between the beam entrance and the lungs. So we're using the patient's own arms as a way of scaling their lungs from those lateral beams. And um, uh, we can see also the head compensators which are present at CT, although you can also add this as a structure for the clips, which is what we've moved to do now. And the addition of neck bolus in the scan as well is also present. So this is sort of a, a typical dose distribution that we can achieve with a line to the eye. So you can see um, the neck region usually does receive a slightly higher dose, and this can be reduced further by actually increasing the thickness of that head compensator or adding neck bolus. But what you can also see is the sort of self-shielding effects of those arms, why we have the arms in the beam path of those natural fields, is because we want to cool down the lung region. So that's quite important for us as well. So for us at Peter Mac, we have a choice of photon beams. We can choose from 6, 10, or 18 MV fields. And this is largely dependent on the patient size. So smaller patients, 6 MV will be adequate, especially pediatrics. We only use 6 MV for pediatrics. 10 MV is appropriate for most adults. But if a patient's particularly large, we might have to resort to using 18 MV. And I use the word resort because we do try to avoid it where possible because of those incidental uh, neutron generations, which add additional dose to the patient that is not explicitly modeled. So only when we really can't achieve good dissymmetry with 10 MB, will we use um, 18 MB. Uh, we can reduce the lung dose for this technique by, as I said, those lateral beams through the arms, but also that chest bolus that the patient wears under the armpits. And we can reduce the neck hot spots with the neck bolus and the head compensator. So I mentioned briefly the lung doses. There is um, data in the literature to, to suggest that lung doses and possibly even lung dose rates are important for um, toxicity. 
So on the one hand, we've got um, this data from Dr. Atomo, who subdivided their patients into those who received more than 9.4 gram mean lung dose and those who received 9.4 or less grade mean lung dose. And you can clearly um, detect an increased uh, lethal pulmonary complication rate for those patients who received higher than 9.4 gram. Um, other um, studies have looked at similar dose levels. In this case, it was 8 gram mean lung dose. And despite a clear um, cutoff of follow-up time, there was some indication that a minimum dose of H grade in this particular study was important for predicting overall survival. So while there are various different ways of delivering TBI, there is at least some evidence out there to suggest that sort of 8 to 9 gram minimum dose is important for patient outcomes. So what can we do about that? Well, as I mentioned, we also do have the option of standing TBI using lung blocks and lung shields. So the downside to a standing TBI is the patient has to be actually healthy enough to stand for a relatively long time. This is about 30 minutes per session. Remembering, of course, that we have a reduced medic dose rate and, of course, there's some setup time required as well. So this is not going to work for all patients, but for those who are well enough, it's one option for um, shielding the lungs. These um, standing TBIs are treated with ant and post fields only, and you can see here in the diagram um, patients standing behind that perspex screen, and hopefully you can also see those lung blocks attached physically to that perspex screen, and you can also see in the lower photo the outline of where those chest blocks um, are from the um, uh, field lines. Um, so what we don't want to do with TBI is shield any bony structures. So of course, any region of chest wall that's within those lung shielding blocks will actually be shielded unintentionally. So what we do is we actually boost these areas with an electron field to um, hopefully cover any residual um, disease blood uh, cells that are in those chest wall regions. So here you can see a CR cassette image, which is used for treatment uh, verification of those lung shielding blocks. Um, the CR cassette sits behind the patient. We take an image of fraction one, and here you can see the outlines of those lung shielding blocks, and you can also see the patient that is behind that. So here we just want to shield um, the lungs, but we don't want to encroach on those chest walls. Or you can almost hopefully make out here that, that clavicle as well, that is a, a part of the target bone. We do not want to shield that clavicle, which is why you can see how that those lung shields sort of dip in uh, in the medial aspect. Um, we can also see a slight outline of the lung, so we are not shielding um, the, the spine or the chest wall, just that middle, middle, uh, middle part portion of the lungs. So does lung shielding actually help? What difference are we making to the dissymmetry? Well, we've done our own in-house study recently, and this is in preparation, though it's not published just yet. But what we can see is that um, relative to the prescription dose, all of our lying techniques, regardless of the dose, receive between 100 and 110% of the prescription as a mean dose to the lungs, and that's even with um, chest goals. So it's quite difficult to spare the lungs with a lying technique. Our standard TBI, however, with lung shields, reduces the relative mean lung dose to about 75% of the prescription. So there's clearly a benefit there to the shielding blocks, even with the addition of those electron chest wall um, boost doses included in that lung DBH. We do, however, need outcome data to see whether this actually makes a clinical difference. That's where it's important. But at least from now, we can see that the shielding, despite being additional work, does actually reduce the overall mean lung doses. So some of the TBI challenges, we're obviously dealing with large fields and dissymmetry depends on the, the environment, by which I mean the Linac bunker. You've got um, scatter conditions from the wall, floor, ceiling, any equipment that you're using. So in our case, in the TBI trolley. So this is where physics really have to get in there and measure under um, clinical conditions, even in, a, in just a phantom, what are the scatter conditions in your Linac environment for your specific setup. Um, never assume that a treatment planning system that's commissioned under standard conditions can also model the dose of extended SSD. So the TPS itself, the treatment planning system, requires very careful commissioning to make sure that it is appropriate for use in those non-standard scenarios. Um, for the measurements themselves, there's sometimes ion chamber issues to consider. So what is the leakage current in your ion chamber and electron relative to this now relatively low signal at extended SSD? 
you are irradiating a very large area. So you've got cable in your field. What are the extra camera effects? So there's some good physics in there, but a lot of additional considerations for these non-standard conditions. Um, a commissioning, you need to also consider a backup machine. If this linac goes down that you've commissioned for TBI, you need a backup plan because the patient cannot simply um, miss their evening fraction, for example. Um, in vivo dissymmetry is a very common feature in TBI. A lot of centres are doing it, even if there's no consensus as to how best to do this. Some centres are using an iron chamber in the field, some centres are using MOSFETs or TLDs or diodes, um, especially when the service is new. So in vivo dysmetry is quite important for TBI. You also need expert staff and the associated resources. So RTs who are familiar with patient setup, physics, in our case, physics do the, the treatment planning. We can also be present for um, unusual TBI setups and the radiation oncologist, of course, and if appropriate, hematologists um, and transplant surgeons. So it's quite a multidisciplinary team requiring some specialist knowledge. What's the future of TBI? Well, large open fields have been quite standard for a very long time, and that tends to be what we have most experience with and what we're most comfortable with. But a lot of centres are now looking at more exotic means of delivering TBI. So that could involve multiple isocentric VMAT, um, term of therapy. Um, some centres are using total marrow irradiation, in, at least in their planning studies. I haven't seen that widely used clinically though, but it is technically feasible from a planning perspective. Some uh, clinicians are discussing the risk of um, missing circulating blood volume. So as you're radiating parts of the body, you're actually potentially missing circulating cells. But again, there's not a whole lot of evidence thus far. It's still in sort of a technical feasibility stage. Um, need to consider dose rates, timing of radiation with circulating blood, lung doses to shield or not to shield. Obviously, this would depend on each individual center. And of course, there's plenty of opportunity for us physicists to really get involved and make a difference for these techniques. So I'll just finish off by talking about total body electrons. So TV comes with different names, but it all means the same thing. So you could say total skin electron therapy, total skin electrons, a whole bunch of other acronyms as well. It all basically means the same thing. And in very simple terms, it's basically TBI, but for skin treatments. And we'll talk about what exactly that means. So the clinical indications of TBI, um, we aim to irradiate the skin and spare all the remaining underlying tissue. So you can imagine that's quite tricky. Um, commonly, this is used to treat mycosis fungoids and uh, a few other rare skin conditions as well. And you can see that these diseases can actually be quite nasty. So this is a photograph of a patient who was diagnosed with MF, mycosis fungoids, and you can see these really sore red-looking lesions. But you can also see the photograph of that same patient after TB treatment and just how effective this can actually be. So it is really an important treatment option for those who might not otherwise have any options, especially when this is widespread throughout the whole body. Um, so the dose distribution is ideally uniform and there are various methods available by which you can deliver this TB. A typical prescription for TB is 30 gray in 20 fractions in 1.5 gray fractions. I've seen a few variations but that one seems to be the most common. So what does this sort of target volume look like in treatment planning terms? Well, if I had to loosely draw it, it would look something like this. The CTV is the whole skin surface from head to toe and everything else underlying is the organ risk. So this is actually a very complicated volume to be treated. There are different options. Um, there's a translational option where, especially if you've got a patient who cannot stand, you can slide them underneath a static beam. There are large static field options where you can use a spoiler actually to degrade the beam. So a patient stands behind a screen um, and you can beam uh, an upper field and a lower field to cover the whole body. Or um, there's a rotational op option. So that's the photo down the bottom where a patient stands on a platform that actually rotates while that beam is on. And this technique is quite nice because it exploits the electron fluidity under a rotation in order to achieve Dmax at the surface. So let's just explore what do I actually mean by that? What, what am I exploiting in terms of electron PVDs? Well, hopefully this is a familiar image to you. This is a, a standard 6 MeV beam in a 10 by 10 field 
then I've been exposed um, on a piece of uh, film and have scanned that out. So you're carrying at about 1.3 centimetres and you've got your practical range down at about uh, 3.1 centimetres. You can see those bulging electron isotopes lines and hopefully this is a familiar sort of image to you. But this is under normal incidence. So what actually happens if I angle my beam and come out of slab of solid water at an angle? What actually happens then to my isotopes lines at depth? Um, so what we, what we see with electrons is that at normal incidence, if these are your isotopes lines at depth, as we see the angle of incidence, you're actually shifting your depth of mass windows towards the surface as those bulging isotopes lines start to overlap. Um, and what we can actually see is that in action, here I've measured a TB PDD under a full rotation with a piece of film. So you can actually see that my um, normal 6 MEV beam now has a DMAX at the surface under a full rotation of a rotating phantom. So that's what we're exploiting here because that's exactly what we want to do. We want to treat the skin and try and spare as much as possible any underlying tissue. So at Peter Mac, we use this rotational technique. The patient actually stands on this um, rotating platform, which is controlled from outside of the bunker. The Lenac is um, angled sideways to face the patient who's near the wall. And the patient stands on this turntable and holds onto these handles. And we can actually alternate the patient's arm position um, every second, every fraction. So on one fraction, they might have their right hand up. On the next fraction, their right hand will be down, and that's to sort of even out those cold spots that would otherwise be occurring if the patient stood in the same position every day. So we use an upper field, which is um, then complemented by a lower field, and each of those two um, dose profiles will combine to create a, a large um, profile sum. Um, so you can see uh, what I mean by that. These are two individual TV fields, an upper and a lower. And we can also see the combined sum of those two fields, which is our final TV field profile, which is really large. We're covering two meters, which is really effective in treating the whole body. Um, we can see also a slight peak in the center of the field. We could control this. If we wanted to, we could flatten that out by increasing the separation between the two fields. But what we find is that the torso of the patient, so the um, thorax and pelvis, is usually a bit larger compared to the thinner areas, so the legs and the arms. So the torso is usually a bit more self-shielded under rotation compared to those thinner parts of the body. So we actually want this peaked dose profile to occur on that otherwise cold region of the body. So what we find is this 10% higher dose in the peak of the profile actually works best for us and gives us a more uniform dysmetry. So some familiar challenges associated with TBE. We're again talking about large fields. We're also talking about uh, low signal to our ionization chambers as they're used in the field. We're also again dealing with that familiar extra camera signal as a lot of cable ends up in the field. We also of course need to include in vivo dissymmetry. But a unique challenge associated with a rotating TBE is that there's no planning system that will calculate for you the dose to a rotating body. First of all, we can't guarantee the patient will hold their arm in exactly the same position. Um, we would need a full body CT scan in two sort of positions, and you would need to, potentially the only option is to have um, lots of individual fields um, simulating that rotation. So at the moment, there's no good planning system data that will simulate a TBE treatment. But this is important because we are expecting some cold spots. So how do you accurately assess the dose distribution over the entire body and inform cold doses, which eventually, at least in our case, get boosted at the end of treatment. So really, the only good option that you have is in vivo dysmetry, and certainly our TBI program relies very heavy on, heavily on in vivo dysmetry. Um, so this is used to help define those boost areas, not just um, the location, but also by how much, what is the prescribed dose to those boost areas, how cold are they? It's also fantastic as a routine QA tool for our TB service because if you um, consolidate your all your patients who are undergoing TB and monitor that data, you can look for new trends over time. It does require ongoing monitoring, and in our case, lots of TLDs um, for every patient. We have 26 standard positions that we measure over two fractions, so it is a bit of a workload 
Um, but again, it is essential. There's no other way of reporting the dysentery to these patients. Um, so we monitor not only the prescription dose, but also the dose to any organs at risk. And here in this example, you can actually see the patient has these um, bits of tape on the end of his fingernails. These are actually ledge threads that we have strapped to each of these individual um, fingernails. Because if you don't shear the nail beds, they, they sometimes fall out, which is a bit of a, an unpleasant side effect for these patients. So in cases where there's no evidence of disease around the ends of the fingers, we will actually opt to shear the nail beds. And similar with the eyes, we will actually add eye shields if there's no disease around the eye area. So this is a TB patient who has undergone his treatment, but is then getting his boost fields to um, those, those cold areas. So very common cold spots are the um, tops of the shoulders, inner thighs, as well as the, um, the scalp, which is obviously very difficult to radiate when a patient is facing um, the unit. So those boost fields, the prescription of those, are informed by our Indian um, dysmetry. So this is what it looks like to consolidate all of your in vivo dysmetry data into one place. So you can see um, the measured dose uh, in, in grey, you can see the prescription region. And there is obviously a lot of variation in the dysmetry depending on the parts of the body. So the scalp and the scalp vertex, for instance, will get a cold dose. This is a known and unexpected underdose. Tops of shoulders, again, they're sort of self-shielded to an extent. And uh, the, these are right and, upper, right and left upper medial thighs, which again, depending on how wide the patient can stand, uh, their legs apart, will receive an underdose as well. Um, the prescription regions, this is the torso, uh, the thorax and abdomen. You can see that there's a slight underdosage. This is something that we're aware of and that the ROs are comfortable with. We have got good outcome data. If we were to boost the overall treatment, we we'll start to get even higher doses to these other areas, so the elbows and, and the feet. Um, so at the moment, the hour is not changing anything at this stage. But again, this is fantastic data, great to monitor, and um, something we can keep an eye on and adjust if appropriate. So I'll just finish off by making a quick note on brushing and photon contamination. So even though we're dealing with electron fields, you do also have to consider that there is um, photon contamination as a result of interactions within the scatterfoils in the machine. So you can see um, here we've got an electron PDB under standard conditions, so 100 SSD for a 6 MeV beam, you can see in red. And in black, we've actually got a PDB for the same beam, but at our 3 meters SSD, which is what we use for TDB. So two features you can see. First of all, a degradation in beam quality, as you would expect over a large distance of air. But also you can see the branch from tail, that photon contamination has actually changed. And if we zoom in on that part of the graph, you can see that compared to the standard form of SSD, the photon contamination has actually increased slightly. And at least in the case of a variant machine, you can see that if you were to scan across the profile of your branch strong photon contamination, that the profile is actually peaked. So the core or the center of your patient is actually receiving that extra photon dose in the entire course of their rotational treatment. There's not a whole lot you can do about this, but as physicists, it's great for us to actually explore this, have the data in hand, and have that discussion with your radiation oncologist just to be aware of it. There's not much you can do about it. You can't effectively shield it or get rid of it. It's just something that's a little bit higher than your standard settings that's just to be noted um, and explained. So some take-home messages from this um, session. TV are very important treatment options um, for our patients. They do both have some significant um, research requirements, but also some unique dosimetric challenges, which are, I think, exciting for us physicists in a way. But in the dosimetry, I would argue, is very important for verification of these techniques. And thank you all so much for sticking around to the session, whether it's evening or morning. And if there's anything I have